sure you update the new grade right. on Jupiter Yeah, Great. Yeah, Jason, I'll remember. Okay, all right, let's get this show started. All right, so sorry for that hiccup. Hello, everyone, hope you're well. Uh, internet was giving a bit of issues there. I had to restart everything twice. Hopefully that doesn't continue. We're going to go through. Um, let's see, all right. Um, I guess that's an inside joke. I don't even know what that comment is about, but let's actually jump into it. Um, so for today, let me turn off the video. Let's not uh, bother the internet gods. Let, let, for today, I actually just wanted to finish this section. I feel like even after I get through this section, I'm going to end at an awkward spot in the next section that I want to talk about. So even if we finish a little bit early, well, I don't know how early we're going to finish now with that delay. Uh, even if we finish a little bit early, I'm going to wrap things up here. I want to finish up partial fractions today, and then we'll call it a day. Um, but before that, I'm going to talk about the cover-up method. So partial fractions is a, a very important method, and I will recap that today because we kind of rushed through uh, a few steps of it yesterday, so some people might have missed some important information. So I will quickly recap all of these before we get through examples, but I didn't get to talk about 4B at all. So I wanted to start by talking about that. Then I'm going to recap the partial fractions method. Then we're going to do a bunch of examples, and then we're going to get out of here. So let's actually do that. So the cover-up method is a really cool thing. So yesterday's class ended with us figuring out how to break up one large fraction into some generic smaller fractions where we only know about their denominators, but their numerators might be unknown to us at first. And so we have to find a way to figure out what the, um, what the numerators were. And I told you guys two standard methods for approaching that situation, how to actually find what the numerators are. There is another method. There is a method called the cover-up method. Now this is, it's an official method, but it is not an official method in Calc 2. When I did Calc 2, this was not taught to me, but I, after learning it after I went through Calc 2, I realized, why did no one tell me this? And so since that day, I've always taught my Calc 2 classes that because I, I'm always like, why did no one tell me this? And I started tearing people this thing and because it, it was amazing. Uh, the first time I saw it was actually in a course called Complex Analysis, where there's this very big and important theorem when you do complex analysis. Um, was a, I think we only have complex analysis as a graduate course at City College currently. Sometimes undergrads, uh, they, we offer an undergrad course. But I was in a grad course, I learned this really huge important theorem called the residue theorem. And it turns out that one of the small applications of this theorem was a way to discover what the arbitrary constants in a partial fraction decomposition was. One of these instances is particularly so easy to apply that you can apply it in a calculus two context without knowing any high-minded theorems to speak of. And you can essentially do this by covering up parts of the function that you're looking at. So I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to use this guy to illustrate, the guy that we started off with, um, the, this, this guy that launched this whole discussion. I'm going to kind of show you why this thing would work. Then I'm going to show you how it works with a few examples, just to um, um, really hammer it in, how it actually works. And you're gonna realize, wow, that's, that's actually pretty amazing. Uh, it's going to, for this, for some examples, it will make the previous two methods that I taught you seem like they take forever. And you are going to be one of those math ninjas when you compare to yourself to, to students from other classes. They're, they're going to be there trying to go through methods to find arbitrary constants, and you're just going to kind of do it in your head. Um, so it's going to be cool. So one thing I want you to be aware of, though, is the, what I'm going to teach you now does have a restriction. Uh, Non-repeated linear factors. OK? So this is what we want to look for. So this means that when you factor the denominator, all the factors are linear, meaning they look like an, uh, the equation of a line, mx plus b. And then they are non-repeating. So you don't have that raised to a power like we had here. So when we said repeated factors, what I mean is something like this. Like you have a, a factor in the denominator 
that's raised to a power. Like the x squared plus one here is raised to another power. We call the x squared plus one a repeated factor. Or here where the x plus one is raised to a power of three, we say that's a repeated factor. So if you have non-repeating linear factors, so for example, like this equation, this example here, um, you can do the cover-up method. So that's the only uh, requirement. You can also do it for the highest multiplicity factor of a linear factor. So for example, um, here you have a repeated linear factor. The cover-up method will help you find this guy. It will help you find the D. It won't help you find the B or C. Okay, so it will either help you find the coefficients for non-repeating linear factors, or it will help you find the coefficient of the highest multiplicity of the linear factor. But it won't help you find all the lower ones. Okay, so that being said, that's when it will work. Now, here is how it will work. Here's something that you can notice. Um, so here's something I want you to notice. So notice, so here, of course, this is going to be uh, x minus 3 times x minus 2 when you factor that off. Here's what I want you to notice. So if we, if we set as following the first few steps, 1 over x minus 3 times x minus 2 equals a over x minus 3 plus b over x minus 2. Now look at what happens if we multiply by the denominator of a, okay? So suppose we take this original equation and we multiply by the denominator of a, what's going to happen? Um, notice I would get uh, one over x minus two equals a plus b x minus three over x minus two, right? Now, if I plug in x equals three, notice that this makes this makes x minus three equals zero. If I plug in x minus x equals three here, what I would end up with is one over three minus two is equal to a plus zero. And I can right away get what the value of a is. Okay? So I want you to notice that. And I want you to notice what this guy is. You, you'll soon see the pattern. When I, when I show you, it's going to be crazy. OK. Or, or suppose we have the original uh, equation right here. Or I'm, I'm kind of leading you into it here, but you're, you're, once, once you see the method, it's going to be crazy. Um, suppose you have this here and we multiply by the denominator of B. That is, we multiply both sides by X minus two. Then the right side would become one over X minus three. This is going to be A times X minus two over x minus three plus b. And now what we can do is now plug in x equals two. Of course, this would make the denominator b zero. Of b equals zero. Then, if I plug in two, I would get one over two minus three is equal to, that will give me zero plus B. So now B is the only one left and I can solve for B right away. B is going to be minus one just by plugging that in. So I can get that, right? So I can get A equals one by doing this little trick, multiplying by the denominator of A and then plugging in something that would make that denominator zero is going to kill all other variables except the A. Similarly, if I multiply by the denominator of B, then plug in the X that makes that zero, uh, I can solve for B right away, right? Now here is a pattern that, you, so you don't have to write this whole thing out that I just wrote down. 
here's a pattern that we can take advantage of. The pattern we can take advantage of. And I'm going to show you why it's called the cover-up method. But I just noticed that, uh, and that was just an, a curious thing. It's not totally crazy. It's not mind-blowing or anything like that. But um, here is the pattern. We have this, right? If we want to find, if we want to find A, notice what I can do. I can take this guy. I can cover up the denominator of A. and plug in x equals three, right? So cover up the denominator of A on the left, and plug in and you'd realize that that number is actually going to be the coefficient of, it's actually going to be the value of A. Similarly, if you want to find B, what we can do is we can take this equation here, we can cover up and you literally cover it up with your finger or something, you can cover up the denominator of B and plug in X equals the value that would have made that. And that is going to give you the value of B. So you, you can literally just cover things up and oh, this is someone commenting. you can literally just cover up a part of what you see plug in the value that would have made that part of the denominator zero, and that will actually give you the answer for the other guy. So let's actually see this uh, lightning fast in, in this particular situation. How would, how, would I, how would I figure this out? So I have um, one over x minus three times x minus two equals, I know something over x minus three, plus something else over x minus two. How do I find the thing that would go on top of x minus three? Well, cover up the x minus three and plug in three, right? That is going to give me one over three minus two, and that is going to be the value that goes there. If I wanted to find what goes on top of the x minus two, I would cover up the x minus two and then plug in x equals two. So at one point I cover up the other guy, right? So uh, let me, maybe, maybe I'd want to actually show, show this in, in written down. Okay, so if I have one over x minus three times x minus two. So in one situation, what I would do is I cover up the x minus three cover up x minus cover up x minus three and plug in x equals three. That is going to give me the value that will go on top of the x minus three. Similarly, if I cover up the x minus two. I would end up with one over X minus three times X minus two, cover that up and plug in the thing that would have made it zero. So I plug in X equals two. That is going to be the coefficient that goes on top of here. Now you don't even have to write these down. You literally just like cover it up with your finger and you can write the numbers down right there. And that's actually the cheat code. That is actually a shortcut. So, um, so if I were to do this like in one fail soup, 
So I have 1 over x squared minus 5x plus 6. I start by factoring. Oh, this is 1 over x minus 3, x minus 2. I know that this is going to break up into x minus 3, x minus 2. And then I'm like, oh, I have non-repeating linear factors. Therefore, I can just cover up, and I'm literally covering up uh, the x minus 3 with my finger on the screen right now. You guys can do it as well. Cover up the x minus 3 with your finger, plug in x equals 3. I would get 1 over 3 minus 2, which is 1. Then I move over here, cover up the x minus 2 with your finger, plug in x equals 2, and you, you would get minus 1. And that's the partial fractions. Right? You can literally do it in your head. Now, remember, last class, I went through an entire method where you can either do this, all of this, expand everything and equate coefficients and all that. You could also do something like plug in convenient values for x and then solve for that. But the cover up method is a whole other thing where you can literally just in, in one line in your head find the coefficients. Yeah. You know, when you got 1 over x minus 3 plus negative 1 over x minus 2, you yeah. used the cover-up method, but you didn't really finish integrating because actually it would be uh, one Integrating wasn't a part of the, the question. Integral? Integrating wasn't a part of the question. We're focusing on finding the partial fractions right now. We'll get to integration later. We're not doing integrals right now. Well, I thought you were talking about integration by partial fractions because that's something I learned earlier about the integration method of partial fractions. Yes, yes. I but before, doing... before I teach you integration by partial fraction, I have to teach you about partial fractions, right? I mean, like, like what is a partial fraction? Cover How do you method? find it? Okay. Focus on one thing at a time. We have to learn one thing at a time, okay? I'm not going to throw everything all at you at once. I want you to focus on being able to find the partial fractions. Then you can integrate it if you have to. But this is the focus right now is the cover up method. This is just covering things up to find the coefficients on top. Let's actually do some more examples right off the bat. And by the way, it doesn't have to only be two factors. You can actually do this with multiple factors. Suppose I have something like uh, eight over um, x minus two times x minus three times x plus 1. To find the partial fractions, we know that we would split this up into the factors here. And if I had to find the coefficients, what I would do is cover up the x minus 2 on the left with my finger and plug in x equals 2. So on top of here, you would have 8 over minus 1 times 3. Cover up the x minus 3 with my finger and plug in x equals 3. I would get 8 over 1 times 4. Then for the x plus 1, cover up the x plus 1 on the left with my finger and plug in x equals minus 1, because that would make that 0. And I would get 8 over minus 3 times minus 4. And those guys are your coefficients. You can do it like right on the spot. So this is minus 8 over 3, x minus 2. This is plus 2 over x minus 3. And this is going to be uh, plus uh, 2 over 3 over x plus 1. That's the partial fractions. OK, so so far for the cover-up method, do we get this? Do we see how it works? Do you have to reduce the fractions, too, or no? Um, what do you, well, I, I mean, you wouldn't leave your answer like this. So yeah, you'd, you'd simplify a little bit. Because, yeah, to Jason's point, usually when you're doing this, it's within the context of some integral. So after you do this, you're going to want to do integration. You might have to do like the fundamental theorem of calculus. So yeah, you re, you're going to really want things to be somewhat simple so that you can manipulate them later on. Um, but yeah, ju just for how to actually find the coefficients, hopefully that's clear. Yeah, we do do a little bit of cleanup afterwards, um, but sometimes you don't even need that cleanup. With, with, the first, the, with this example right here, I could see that that was one and minus one right away. It didn't really 
take uh, much cleanup. And, uh, and, and here's the thing. Now, if I had, here's another example. Suppose I had, uh, whatever, one over x minus three, x minus four, uh, x, uh, x minus four squared. Let's say I had that. So here I have a repeated linear factor, okay? So this would obviously break down into a over x minus three, b over x minus four, and this over x minus four squared. So it turns out you can use the cover-up method for this guy because he's a non-repeating linear factor, and you can use the cover-up method for this guy because he's the highest multiplicity of a linear factor. So cover-up method would work for these two. But then this guy, you, you don't know what this is. So you can call this, say, B, that you have to find B later. But what you can do is you can do the cover-up method for these two. So for this one, I'm just going to actually cover up the X minus 3 and plug in 3. So this would be 1 over 3 minus 4, all squared. That is going to give me plus 1. 1 is going to be the coefficient up here. Then for the X minus 4 squared, I can cover up the entire x minus 4 squared. So I look at the 1 over x minus 3 times x minus 4 squared. I am going to cover up the, the whole thing here and plug in x equals 4. Evaluate this at x equals 4, and I would get 1. And I can put that here. Now, to find the B, what you would do is you would use one of the previous methods. However, it's not going to be like a whole system of equations or anything like that that you have to deal with, because now there's only one guy you have to figure out. So uh, to find the B, you would use the previous, to find, to find B, use one of the previous methods. So for example, I could do something like multiply across by the denominator on the left. That would leave me here with x minus four squared plus b times x minus three times x minus four plus uh, x minus three. And then I can just plug in some random number. So plug in x equals 0. Why? Just because. And yes, I know how to spell because. Um, so if you plug in x equals 0, you'd get 0 minus 4 squared plus you'd get b times 12 and you would get minus 3. So you would have 1 equals 16 plus 12b minus 3. So 16 minus 3 is 13. You move it to the other side here. This is minus 12. And so you would get b equals minus 1. And that is what you would bring uh, up. up here and plug in b equals minus one. So that's the cover-up method. So it helps you to find the coefficients, uh, the, the arbitrary constant numerators of non-repeating linear factors. If your linear factor is repeated, you can still use this method to find the highest multiplicity linear factor. And then all the other guys in the interim, you use the old methods. But at the same time, this is still going to save you a lot of time because now you won't have to find all, you won't have to have so many arbitrary constants floating around. You can get a lot of them out of the way with the cover-up method. And then 
Yeah, you use method one or method two from last time to find all the other guys. So um, in practice, this is a great time saver. And I can tell you uh, from years of tutoring and all that, like whenever I pull, I, I do this trick like in front of a student, they like freak out. Wait, 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 wait. What did you just do? How do you do that so fast? How do you do? Yeah, so you can do that and then you can like just like pop your collar and you're like, yeah, wouldn't you like to know? You know, I, I did, uh, you know, did it really find my head? This is a this is one of the the perks of uh, being good at math because then it freaks everyone out when you are when you do something so quickly and easily that they can't do. And a lot of times it's just a trick. You just have this little shortcut in your head that they don't even know about. So sometimes you're watching these videos on YouTube and stuff, and you see these people doing all these crazy calculations in your head, and you'd be surprised. They have all these tricks that they're doing that the audience doesn't know about. And so it's like, like, how does he do that? I don't mean like integration B. Integration B is one of them. But I mean like those people who do, do like crazy arithmetic in their head, where they like multiply two six digit numbers and then and they say the answer faster than someone would have gotten it if they typed it into a calculator. It turns out that they have a lot of visualization techniques and tricks that they can do to actually get to the answer quicker, right? And when it comes to partial fractions and finding coefficients, the cover-up method is such a trick. Uh, you can literally cover it up with your finger. Uh, you'll eventually get so good that you won't even have to cover it up with your finger. You can just eyeball it and do, cover it up in your mind's eye and just write down the coefficient. And it's gonna totally freak out anyone who doesn't know the cover-up method. They're gonna be like, how did you, how did you do that so fast? Anyway, but yeah. And with practice, again, a lot of things, even if you're learning it at first and it's kind of weird, with practice, you will get uh, very good at it. And I'll talk about that in a future lecture, actually. Um, tell you guys a little story later on. But that is the cover-up method. So um, hopefully you guys tried uh, the problems that I left for you yesterday. We're going to redo some problems. And for some of those problems, I'm going to actually use the cover-up method. And you can compare it to what you had written out using the other methods fractions and then the integration after that are you guys hearing me i got one of those messages that said um my internet connection was on the table i can hear you okay all right so remember Professor, you're frozen again a little bit now. The in the in into what about now? Nope, still a little bit laggy. Oh, interesting. Well, 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 we're back here again. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, guys. Are you ready for to all. learn about the integration of partial fractions? All right, guys. Free for all. Let's shoot the shot. Don't worry, Solomon. I promise this time I won't roast your ass as hard. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, crap. <laughs> okay, I'm back. All right, so hopefully that fixed everything. All right, uh, let's see. Okay, so let's go back over uh, partial fractions decomposition and get back into uh, why we want it. Awesome, so the lag is gone, great. Um, and let me check that I'm still recording. I am recording. Okay, so this was the partial fractions method in a nutshell, how to do a partial fraction decomposition. Of course, after this, you might have to do integration, but this is how you're going to break things down. So let's review. You have a, uh, a, something that you think you might need partial fractions for, right? And this is some integration context. One, it only works on rational functions, meaning ratios of polynomials, where the denominator factors and the numerator has a lower degree than the denominator. Now, if your numerator does not have a lower degree, we looked at two ways in which you can actually break things down to obtain a situation where your numerator has a lower degree than your denominator. So that's the first thing in the partial fractions. Partial fractions is when you take a bigger fraction and you want to break it into smaller fractions. However, you can only break up the bigger fraction if those two criteria are fulfilled, uh, at least breaking it up via this method. So you have to make sure that the denominator is factorable. You have to also make sure that the numerator is uh, of lower degree than the denominator. So that's the first thing. Second thing, once you know that's true, you are going to want to factor the denominator completely. Okay? So once you do that, you are going to now break up the larger fraction into smaller fractions where each of the factors in the denominator of the bigger fraction is individually their denominators of the smaller fractions. You're going to do this, and on top of that, you're going to make sure that the, the numerator of these fractions are generic polynomials, meaning general polynomials, all degrees accounted for. They are general polynomials of one degree lower than the denominator, right? And that one degree lower is referring to the inside factor of the original guy, okay? So yeah, if it was just if it, if it were just x squared, if you just had one over x squared, you would still break this up into a over x plus b over x squared. Squared, you'd you'd still do that. So, all right, so now the other thing is, if you have a repeated uh, factor, you have to count up to the multiplicity of that factor, which means the highest power has to be something that you build up to. So you start with the power one, then the power two, then the power three, et cetera, and you eventually build up to the highest factor. And the numerator follows the same pattern, but it follows the pattern based on the inner factor, not the, not the outside power, but the inner factor, the base factor, okay? So you'll break those up. Now step four is to find the coefficients, find the actual arbitrary constants here. And you can do this by one of two methods. Both methods start out in the same way. You're going to multiply both sides by the denominator on the left. So you multiply everyone by the big denominator. 
this is going to clear all denominators and leaves you with a, an equation where there are no rationals in it. Method one says plug in convenient values for x. And that the, the most convenient value is, of course, ones that allow you to eliminate all the other variables except one, and you can solve for that one. And you can go through and do this by plugging in repeated values for x. You can eventually solve for all the guys by going through that. Method two is to, again, multiply both sides by the denominator on the left to get this situation. However, you now expand the right side. You group like powers. And then you compare coefficients on both sides of the equation. The, the coefficients for powers of x on one side must be equivalent to the coefficients for powers on the other side, for equivalent powers. That way, you can end up with a system of equations that you can now solve for the values that you want. If you have linear factors, non-repeating, you can apply the cover-up method. And I just went through that with you guys. If you have a repeated linear factor, you can apply the cover-up method only to the highest power. So only to something like this guy, for example. Now, once you do that, you will have written the big fraction as a bunch of smaller fractions. And by doing that, you can now manipulate these guys a lot easier because there are many contexts in which dealing with these guys on the left and on the right side is going to be easier than dealing with this guy on the left side, particularly when it comes to integration. Being able to integrate these smaller guys individually is going to be, in general, easier than trying to figure out how to integrate this big guy over here. But in a nutshell, recapping, that is the method of partial fractions. Now we can do integration by partial fractions by simply first finding the partial fractions. And then integrating the individual terms. They're just on their own. So let's actually just do that right now. Uh, so here are examples that I asked you guys to do. Let's actually. Uh oh, <laughs> Professor, you're cutting up and uh, you're lagging. Okay. I didn't even get uh, an error message just now. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Okay. That being said, it's your time to chime in. <laughs> so tell me what do you want to do here. The goal is to break, find the partial fractions. Oh, you would factor the denominator? Hello? Uh, check the degree of the numerator is uh, smaller than that of the denominator. But yes, the first thing now you, the second thing you're going to do is factor denominator. So that is going to give us uh, 5x squared plus 20x plus 6 over x times x squared plus 2x plus 1. 
well, that's equal to 5x squared plus 20x plus 6 over x times x plus 1 squared. What's the next thing? Then you would write out the factors. Then you what? Then you would write out the fact write out the factors like um, a over x. Okay. So now the oh. third thing is to break up. Yeah, break up the factors. Now, how does that actually look? Uh, So what would this break up into? Tell me that. Uh, a, over, a over x plus b over x plus 1 plus c over x plus 1 squared. Right. And now you just need to find the coefficients. Right? So step four, find coefficients. Find the uh, coefficients. Now we have a bunch of methods to do that. And now we also have the cover-up method. So I can realize that uh, by cover-up, I know that my A is going to be equal to, I'm going to take this guy over that guy and plug in x equals zero. Right now, again, of course, you would do this by like covering up with your finger, but it, it's hard for me to show you that online. So I'm gonna write it out. So you plug in x equals zero and you would get six. That's your A. You could also find the C. The C is going to be the guy that when you get five x plus 20 x plus six over x, and you're going to plug in x equals minus one. And that is going to be five minus 20 plus six over minus one. So that is going to be, what is that? Uh, positive nine. So that is the A and the C. Now we have to find the B, right? So I'm going to take, uh, take this guy. And I'm going to multiply through by the denominator on the left, right? So that is going to look like 5x squared plus 20x plus 6 equals a times x plus 1 squared plus b times x times x plus 1 plus c times x. And now we know what the a is. We know that a is 6. We know that c is 9. And so I can use a uh, another method. So I can say plug in x equals 1. This will give me 5 plus 20 plus 6 equals 6 times 2 squared plus b times 2 plus c, which is 9. So then we would have, this is 31 equals uh, and uh, add that to that that's 33 move that over here that's minus two 
So B is minus one. That in the original, my A is going to be six, my C is going to be nine, and my B is going to be minus one. And the question is, why did I plug in x equals one? This, just because. Can plug in anything. Right, so I just picked one because one is just an easy number to deal with. Now, ordinarily I would pick zero, but if I pick zero, zero would kill the B, right? Because the, the B right here, you have a BX sign, da, da, da. So you plug in anything convenient. Plug in the smallest number that, because, so technically I could plug in 17 and I could still solve for B, but why would you plug in 17? Now you're gonna have to do with 18 squared and times six. So you plug in whatever number. The best numbers to plug in is something that would actually uh, get everyone else to be zero. But in this case, I already knew what the value of everyone else is. So I just plug in anything. Uh, just make it small enough so that I don't have to work too hard. And that is our uh, partial fractions. Now, hopefully you guys got the same thing. What about this one? What did you guys do here? So the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator because the denominator is degree four, the numerator is degree three. So what do we want to do here? I'll break up the fra uh, fraction into smaller pieces. Nope, not yet. No, you don't multiply the denominator. You factor the denominator. Multiplying out is literally the opposite, right? So you don't want to multiply out the denominator. You want to factor the denominator. Notice that this here is not fully factored. So yeah, the first yeah. thing you're going to want to do is factor that denominator. Then you're going to break that up into the pieces. So it's going to be a over x, uh, a over x plus b over x minus 1 plus cx plus d over x squared plus 4. Now you want to find the guys. Um, so this means that if I take 2x cubed minus 4x minus 8, this is going to be a times x minus 1 times x squared plus four plus b times x times x squared plus four plus cx plus d times x times x minus one. Now I can find a by the cover up method. I can do this is two x cubed minus four x minus eight over x minus one times x squared plus four, and I plug in x equals zero. That is going to give me minus eight over minus one times four. And so that is going to give me two. I can find my b using cover up method.
by that and plugging in x equals one. This is going to give me two minus four minus eight over five. So that is minus two. So for these, I, I use the cover up method. Now, cover method is not going to work here. Um, there are tricks to use for uh, things that are not linear factors. That's applying a general ver a more general version of the residue theorem, but it's actually a lot more work than is, is that makes it cool. It's just some. It's just a, a whole other method. Uh, so for the C and the D, we're going to go back to the old school way of uh, actually just trying to plug in convenient values and solving for C and D. And at this point, we know the A. So here, plug in X equals, so you're gonna go back to the original. Let's call this one right here. One, I feel like, okay, we'll probably miss, miss one. Let's call it uh, star. Go back to star and plug in some random value. So um, plugging in zero is not going to be useful. Plugging in one is not going to be useful. Um, so I can do something else like plug in minus one. That's a pretty small number. Then on the left side, I would have minus two plus four minus eight. And on the right side, I would have A, which is two times minus two times five plus B, which is minus two times minus one times five plus I would have minus C plus D times minus one times minus two. So this is going to be, um, that's minus 10 plus four. This is minus six equals minus 20. Um, this is plus 10. And this is going to be plus 2D minus 2C. Um, we can clean this up a little bit. So here, this is going to be minus 10. Move it over there. It's going to be 4. Uh, yes. Or in other words, 2 is going to be equal to D minus C. Now we'll come back to this. And then... You can do something else like plug in X equals, I don't know, say two. If you go and you plug in X equals two, let me remind myself of this guy right here. Plug in x equals two, I would get here, this would be eight times two, that would be 16 minus eight minus eight. Then my a I know is two, and I'm plugging x equals two, so that's gonna be one. This is going to be eight plus b, which is minus two. This is going to be two. This is going to be eight. Professor, can't you do a substitution for C and D on the top? Substitution where? Where would I apply like, a substitution? Like you could put D equals to negative two minus C and then plug that in and then you would figure out D and then you would figure out. Yeah, but plug that into what? I don't have another equation to plug it into. 
So if I, I solve for D as C and plug it into what? I'm, I'm finding another equation to plug stuff into, right? Because here I have one equation and two unknowns. So I'm trying to find another equation. So at this point here, we would have 2C plus D. That's going to be 2 times 1. So in other words, this is going to give me 0 equals 16 um, minus 32 plus 4C plus 2D. Right. So this is another, this is an equation where I, I can do a substitution method like what you were suggesting, but I needed another equation to do it with. So at this point, I would have, so on, this is going to be minus 16, throw it over here. It's going to be plus 16 equals 4C plus 2D. And I can divide this by 2. And I would have that. Now, now I can do some like you suggested. Since D equals 2 plus C, I can get 8 equals 2C plus 2 plus C. Or in other words, 6 is equal to 3C, and my C is going to be 2. This would, of course, means that my D is 4. So here I had my A is 2, blah, blah, blah. So let's, let's go back and plug these guys in. A, I believe, was 2. B was minus two. C is two and D is four. Those would be the partial fractions. A lot of arithmetic. Let's go through the other ones. And in, in, in general, and we'll see this a little bit later on, it's not going to be this crazy just finding the partial fractions. But because it's an example of only partial fractions, I'm giving you ones that are slightly more complicated just to make sure that you can maintain your focus. You know what to do first, second, and third. Um, yeah. So let's say we had this one. So here, again, it's in the right form to do a partial fractions. Uh, we can immediately start breaking this up because it is, uh, it is fully factored in the denominator. So this is going to look like AX plus B over X squared plus 2 plus CX plus D over X squared plus 2 squared. This means... I would have 8x cubed plus 13x is equal to ax plus b times x squared plus 2 plus cx plus d. And so here, if I plug in x equals 0 just because, then I would get 0 equals 2b plus d. That's one equation. If I plug in, say, x equals 1, then I would get um, 8 plus 13. That's going to be 21 is equal to a plus b times 3 plus c plus d. So in other words, um, 21 is equal to 3a plus 3b plus c plus d. I will come back to that. If I can plug in something else like minus 1. 
So this here is minus 21. Over here, it's going to be minus a plus b times 3 minus c plus d. So this means that minus 21 is going to be minus 3a plus 3b minus c plus d. And we have that. Plug in something like x equals x equals 2. Um, then that's going to be 64 plus 26 equals 2a plus b times 4 plus 2c plus d. So that's going to be 90 equals 8a plus 4b plus 2c plus d. And that's another equation. So now I have four equations, four unknowns. So what can we do here? And I, I don't know if you guys did the same method, but uh, maybe you did. I don't know. Um, so at this point, we have this guy. And we have this guy. And we have this guy. And we have this guy. Maybe I'll clean this up a little bit. So we get this. Now you just have a system of four equations with four unknowns. And yeah, now we, we go through the painstaking process of uh, trying to do this. So from here, I will just say, well, D is equal to minus two B. And this means, <laughs> this is great. Is that sarcasm for you? <laughs> uh, so that means that I would have 21 equals uh, D equals minus 2B. 21 equals uh, 3A uh, plus 3B plus C minus 2B. So this is actually just uh, B. And if I plug that in here, that would be minus 21 is equal to minus 3a plus b minus c. 
And if I plug it in there, it's going to be 90 is equal to 8a. And if I plug in, that's minus 2b. So this is going to be 2b plus 2c. So now, if you realize, uh, call this equation 1, call that equation 2, call that equation 3. If I take 1 plus 2, that's going to give me 0 is equal to 2b, which means b is 0, which of course also means that d is 0. And so what we would have is 21 is equal to 3a plus c and minus 21 is equal to minus 3a minus c. Those two aren't going to be useful. That's actually the same equation. Uh, yes, use maybe this one here. But my b is 0. So this is going to be 45 equals 4a plus c. And then if I subtract, Uh, Fahim, what, what, what's your question referring to? What variable did I plug in? I'm not sure where you're talking about it. Oh, uh, the D... I had up here is two times the B. Minus two times the B. So once I found that B was zero, uh, the D is automatically zero. So this is going to be, I don't know what you guys are talking about. <laughs> so I knew this, I, I, I'm totally lost. Okay. So this looks like C is minus 51. I, I mean, hopefully I did the arithmetic right here. Um, but eventually now we get the A is 24 and the C is minus 51. That was a lot of arithmetic and arithmetic, my brain shuts down when I do arithmetic. So hopefully that's right. <laughs> but essentially you went through this four equations, four unknowns. And algebra class, yay. Where's the other guy? This, this one shouldn't be so bad. Yeah, trig and algebra, you'll, you'll always need it for all your math classes. 
Okay, this one shouldn't be so bad. Maybe you guys should tell me what to do here. Uh, you would divide by long division because the numerator right. is the same as the denominator. Right. The, this is not proper. So you would either do long division, or in this case, it's actually pretty easy to do algebraic manipulation. I can subtract one and add one on the top. So this is going to be 1 plus 1 over x squared minus 1. What about the x squared minus 1? How do you do the, this guy? How do you deal with that? But then you would factor, factor, out. factor denominator, out, denominator out. Right. So it would be x plus 1 and x minus 1. And now you just uh, put those guys in like so. What's the top of the x minus 1? A. Right? And but tell me the answer. Oh. Are you actually working it out? I wrote, I wrote it somewhere. I just don't know where. Uh, do it right now. Try the cover-up method. Tell me the answer. Is it one half? Yep. See how quick that was? <laughs> yeah, then, try the yeah. try the try it for this one. Um is it one? Uh it's minus one half. Oh yeah, minus one half, yeah. Yeah. So if you have x squared over x squared minus one. It's this guy. Um, so we did a cover up method here. And that was that example. So a bunch of uh, partial fractions. After going through those, you're probably completely sick of finding partial fractions right now. But uh, let's actually go through and apply these guys to some integrals. All right, so here's an integral. So this is our example. Now we're gonna put um, all that out arithmetic that we did, all that stuff we learned about partial fractions, we're gonna put it towards actually evaluating integrals now. So you see an integral like this, and of course you're gonna think, oh, okay, is this a basic rule? Can it simplify, can it substitution works? You realize that none of that is gonna work, so you want to try something else. You see this as a rational function. So, and you can notice that does the denominator actually factor? So that's the first thing that you would check um, here. Uh, does that factor? Seems to be like a two X. Right, so if I make this a minus here and a plus here, so the denominator is going to factor, right? So, uh, but, so denominator factors, but it's not proper. So the first thing you're going to want to do is you want to make it proper. How do I make it proper? Well, um, I'm going to start by um, getting the denominator in the top. So what I can do is I know I need a minus 4x and a minus 3. But now I realize I, I'm supposed to have minus 3x, so I have to add. So I have to correct for that. I have to add x. 
And because I'm minusing three, I would have to add five to get back to the plus two. So here, what I did was get the denominator in the numerator. And here makes correction so that we get the original value back. Right? Because minus 4x plus x is actually minus 3x, which is what the original numerator had. And if I take minus 3 plus 5, that gives me plus 2, which is what the original numerator had. So I do that little trick here. Get the denominator in the top. Or you can do long division, but I'm not going to do that. Here, notice this is going to break up into 1 plus x plus 5 over 2x plus 1 times 2x minus 3. And at this point, we know we're going to do partial fractions, 2x plus 1 over 2x minus 3. And And to get this, I'm going to use the cover-up method. That is going to give me here, uh, I'm going to cover that up. Notice that x equals minus a half is going to make this zero. So I'm going to put on top of here, minus one half plus five over uh, minus four. By plugging in minus a half into this guy after I cover up the 2x plus 1. And over here, making this minus three, uh, positive 3 halves, I'm going to go over here, plug this in, positive 3 halves. And over here, it's going to be over 4. So that's the cover up method. Now I'm going to simplify that a little bit. Um, what is 5 minus a half? over minus 4. I mean, you could do something like multiply by 2 over 2 if you wanted. Um, and that would, that would look like uh, minus 1 plus 10, which is 9 over minus 8. So it's um, minus 9 over 8. So this is minus 9 over 8 over 2x plus 1. Similarly here, I can do that thing, multiply by 2 over 2. That is going to give me 3 plus 10. That's 13 over 8, it looks like. Yeah, I don't know where Jason went. Um, he was our calculator, but he left us. Well, I'm right here, like, you know. Oh, OK. We're, we're just worried. We were worried. Okay, he's here. Don't, Don't worry, worry. I'm here. Like, you know, if you were to integrate this, we would get like the x. Yeah. And subtract, like, you know, nine of nine out of eight, you know, ln yeah. of, you know, ln of two x plus one actually would get the nine out of 16 due to the fact that if you have to take the derivative of right. ln absolute value of two x plus one. And yeah. same thing goes with, you know, third for the ln absolute value of 2x minus 3. It would be 13 out of 16 ln absolute value of 2x minus 3 plus object constant c. Okay. All right. Thank you. You've been silent for a while. We were wondering where you went. Okay. Awesome. That, so that's long. the answer. <laughs> so, boom. There is our our 
original integral. And now you see uh, this thing is losing up. There was our original integral. Here's how you do it. It's a big, messy integral, but we can actually break it down with partial fractions. And you would ultimately get to that answer. Let's do another one. Here's one. You have uh, radical x divided by x minus 4. Ideas? How do we do this one? You would first check if the numerator is lower than the denominator. Well, it is, but not so fast. There's a radical x here, which means it's not a rational function. Oh. Right? So remember, for partial fractions, you need it to be a rational function. Oh, would you multiply by the radical, top and bottom? Uh, that would put a radical in the bottom. So it would still would not be a rational function. Right, substitution is how we'd start. Okay, good for you guys to seeing that. Okay, that is how we'd have to start. As, as it stands, we can't do any partial fractions here. You can do a substitution though. Having that radical would kind of mess up what we want to do. So what I could do instead is say, well, let u equals that radical x. In other words, that means my u squared is going to be x. So 2u du is going to be dx. And so what we would end up with is the integral of u divided by u squared minus 4 times the dx is 2u du. So now we end up with this integral, 2 times u squared over u squared minus 4. And a look at that, grasshoppers. Yes, you are the grasshoppers. <laughs> it's like grasshoppers comment. OK, so now we end up with this. So we're seeing grasshoppers. Now, this, we couldn't apply a technique before, but with a substitution, we brought it into a situation where, yeah, at this point, we can kind of work things out. What I would do at this point is subtract a four, add a four. That allows me to break this up into one plus four over x squared minus four, which I would think of this over u squared minus four. So I would think of this as u minus two times u plus two. And again, uh, by the cover-up method, I can break this up into u, something over u minus two plus something over u plus two relatively quickly. Cover up the u minus 2 and plug in u equals 2, I would get 1. Cover up the u plus 2, plug in u equals minus 2, I would get minus 1. And if you were to integrate it, you would get like, you know, x plus... No, no, not like, x. I mean like 2x, I mean like, look, the integral No, of no, one. be careful, it's not x. You would get u? It's u. You have a du. Yeah, yeah. U, that, I mean, like the variable u plus ln of u minus 2 plus minus ln of u plus 2. And therefore, after that, you close the brackets and you add the arbitrary constant c. Yep. And after that, then you multiply and do the distributive property. Right. But uh, first, let's, we, let's go back to our original variable x. u equals radical x. So we're going to go here. And we're going to plug in radical x everywhere. Well, yeah, as an additional. Yeah. That's one more step. And I mean, we can leave it here. We don't have to multiply out. 
yeah, cover method is really nice. You can like do an integration, you can do a partial fractions decomp by like on the spot without having to go separately and write, oh, here's the A and here's the B and multiply out and plug in this. You're, you can literally do it on the spot. So, and, and this situation comes up nicely. This, this integral here is uh, an integral of a level of difficulty that could show up on a quiz, could show up on a test. And honestly, I wouldn't expect anyone to spend more than three minutes on this guy. Four minutes, if you're, you know, maybe even less. And the cover-up method is going to make it that even quicker. So there's that one. Uh, here's another one. Was there anyone who finished all of these? What about this one? How would we do this one? It looks scary, but it is not scary because we are grasshoppers and we are armed with our training. Substitution, what would you substitute? E to the power X. Substitute u equals e to the x, your du would be e to the x dx. And so this integral would now just become one over u squared plus one times u minus one. Now this one is going to be a little bit harder to uh, find the parts with. So I'd go over here, just do that separately. One over u squared plus one u minus one. I'm going to think of that as a u plus b over u squared plus one plus c over u minus one. Uh, I can do the cover up method. I know the c is going to be equal to cover up the u minus one and plug in one. It's going to be a half. Then I can multiply both sides by the denominator on the left. And just plug in some convenient values. If I plug in, if I plug in say u equals zero, I would get one equals b plus c, but I know c is a half. my b is a half. And I can plug in another value for u, say u equals 1. And I would get 1 equals a plus b plus 2c. But I know that c is a half. And now I know that b is also a half. So this means that 1 is equal to a plus a half plus 1. So this means that your A is one minus three over two. So it's minus a half. And so now I can go back up here and rewrite that. My A is minus a half, my B is positive a half, my C is positive a half. So here I would minus a half plus a half plus a half. And this is what this guy breaks down into. So 
this is going to be equal to, I can do these one by one. So let me say minus a half times u over u squared plus one plus a half times one over u squared plus one plus a half times one over u minus one. Uh, hold on. Did I miss that multiplication? Oh, it should have been. Geez, I should have read that comment earlier. That's what you get when you're rushing too much. There's a U minus one here. How would that change things? If I plug in U equals zero, I would end up having a minus B here. I'm having a minus B, so I end up having a minus a half. So the B is also minus a half. And if I plug in U equals one, so with that u equals one is actually no good. So this whole thing here is not great. So I do something like plug in u equals, I mean u equals minus one would work. This is, this is 2a minus 2b plus 2c. And my b was minus a half, so this is plus 1. My c was plus a half, so this is plus 1. So this means my a is minus a half. So that's, that's still minus a half. Okay. No, that's not ruining the fun. You, you caught a mistake. I, I'll, I'll give you an extra point on your quiz. How about that? We'll move on. That was a big mistake. So let's, uh, so the integrals. For this first one here, that's another substitution, but it's probably one that you can do in your head. That's going to be the ln of that. So it's going to be one half ln of u squared plus one in absolute values, but then you multiply that by the minus one half to get minus a quarter. This one here, what's the middle one? No, you, you get points if Javon makes a big mistake and you pointed it out. But participation is important either way. Like you, you learn better when you participate. Like if you just sit there and watch the lecture, you actually learn a lot less than if you were to make a suggestion and see what happens. So participation is good. You should do it anyway. But if you, if you save me from making a, a big fool of myself, that's even better. Uh, what's the integral of 1 over u squared plus 1? Well, ln over u squared plus 1. No. It's arc 10. Okay, 
And our U was, uh, if memory serves, was e to the x. So that leaves us with the final answer. So this is minus one fourth ln of e to the two x plus one minus one half tangent inverse of e to the x plus one half ln of e to the x minus one plus c. And there. So um, we'll wrap up there. I mean, with all the setbacks we had today, we kind of uh, went over time. That's pretty much done. But I will leave this for you guys to finish up. We'll quickly make, uh, uh, quickly do these the next time. Um, and re this one, remember in example E, we actually did that guy already with trig substitution, I believe. But your goal now is to make sure that you don't use trig substitution. And as you can see here, uh, with the previous two examples in particular, sometimes you might have to apply a substitution or you might have to tweak something first before you even start thinking about it as partial fractions. Remember, that, and it's very important for partial fractions, it has to be a rational function. So for this guy here, when we had that radical x on top, uh, you couldn't actually do a partial fractions decomp of that guy. It's not a rational function. So all these little intricacies are actually pretty important. So if you have something like that, you might first try to do a substitution to get things to look nicer. Then you're going to realize, oh, after doing a substitution, this is something that I would continue to do by part, by not by parts, by partial fractions, right, or et cetera. So some of these, you might have to substitute first. At some point down the line, uh, you are going to have to do partial fractions, but you don't necessarily have to start out using partial fractions. Um, so just keep that in mind while going over these. So do these, we'll make good, uh, we'll get through all of these tomorrow in the beginning of tomorrow's class. And we are going to do a very nice summary of some things just to kind of uh, keep our bearings straight. Um, but for now, uh, let's actually stop there. So that's that. That's it for today. I uh, had some hiccups. I don't know what was going on with my internet. Um, hopefully that doesn't continue tomorrow. Uh, but we'll stop there for now. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Hope you learned a lot. Cover up method is really cool. Practice that uh, whenever you have the chance. And I think we are going to get, uh, we're going to stop there. So good night, everybody. And uh, have fun. Ciao.